Lady Madras by the member Niti Aayog and former Chief Scientific Advisor to the Indian Minister of Defence and Director General DRDO, Dr. V. K. Saraswat. I request Dr. V. K. Saraswat to give the theme address. Her Excellency, Yael Ashawit, Dr. Chandrasekhar, President of NASCOM, Shri Krishnamurti, Arun Kakatkar, if I am not wrong. Right. All the participants to this conference, esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, members of the media, a very good morning. This is the second year in succession that I am attending the Deftronics. During the last meeting and this meeting, we also had the occasion to deliberate on various aspects of uh, electronics design and manufacturing at uh, Vivekananda International Foundation, where we had uh, the presence of a large number of uh, Indian diaspora and of course industry partners, R&D chiefs and so on. Basic idea was to look at how do we make electronics manufacturing as a major input provider for Make in India program. And also to look at whether the policies identified in 2013-14 by the Department of Electronics and IT are they good enough or we have to tweak them to make sure that this contribution of this very vital sector becomes sizable. At that point in time, I did a little bit of uh, search and many of the reports which associations like IESA and NASCOM and now the latest report by Roland Bugger, that was not there at that point in time, of course threw up some very important issues and uh, those issues were not just with respect to the strategic electronics, defense and aerospace, they were also with respect to the global electronics industry in the country. And uh, some of those numbers which I collected, which I am going to narrate today, are for the overall electronics industry. It is not just for the space, aerospace and defense. So when you look at India's uh, electronics industry today, which I am going to cover to some extent is, you have a huge market in consumer electronics, industrial electronics, communication and broadcast equipment, strategic electronics and electronic components. In terms of the kind of market which is there, consumer electronics is of course the highest, $9.1 billion. Next comes of course industrial which is 5.6 communication and also sorry it is the highest is communication 9.5 billion dollars and if you look at strategic electronics that value is very small just about 1.7 billion dollars i used to think that uh, this is a very sizable market and now today dr chandrasekhar and uh, dr kishmurthy mentioned that it's going to be 72 billion dollars obviously there's a projection which is coming up based upon what programs and projects this country has seen. In terms of revenue, Indian electronics industry is just giving about 32.7 billion and demand is rising almost about 25% CAGR. S supply for electronics good is rising almost about 16% and the last report which was prepared indicated that by about 2020, you will need about $400 billion. So there's going to be a huge gap in supply and demand. But the most uh, worrying factor was all this demand, whatever is there today and what we are servicing is about 65 to 70 percent through import. Now we are also operating in a global environment today. It is not that uh, we can wish away the kind of market which prevails which is of the order of 1.8 trillion dollars in which India consumes 
roughly about 125 billion dollars. So from there we are now seeing 104 to 100, 300 billion gap. In terms of our contribution to the GDP, electronics industry's contribution is only 1.7 percent. And uh, if you see other countries, Taiwan makes 15.5, South Korea 15 percent, and China about 13 percent. So there is a big requirement to boost as far as this is concerned. Since there is a huge market for what we call as the Indian consumer durable entire market exists, which is uh, in terms of about 40 percent of the consumer spending in India, it accounts for that. And annual turnover in this is almost of the order of 500 billion rupees. And revenue contribution of this sector is another 50 150 billion and in terms of IIP it is about 5.5 percent and the growth is taking place not just in the urban sectors it is the rural sector which is going to drive the major growth in this segment so it is expected that by 2020 this segment itself will be about 2000 billion that's the kind of market which is emerging but there again while we have uh, this question asked many times that we have AC is being manufactured in the country, TV is being manufactured in the country, washing machines being manufactured, refrigerators, everything. But in each segment, the, even there, the import content is very high. And in some cases, is as high as 70 percent, some cases, and so on. When you look at uh, 25 top priority items which go into the segment, in this segment, like the mobile phones which you are talking. There's another association which I addressed a couple of days back on the mobile phones alone. And uh, it was horrifying to see that our value addition in all the products which are being manufactured does not exceed more than 10% to 12%. And uh, some companies who have been trying to increase that is trying to bring it to about 24 to 30%. So value addition is a major segment in mobile phones, whether it's TV, whether it's notebooks, desktops, or energy meters, or tablets, all those 25 to 30 major items, set up boxes, all of them have a major problem. Now, if you have 7 to 10 percent of value addition, that means you are almost 200 billion loss in about a couple of years. So that is the kind of loss which is happening. And what is this import we are talking of? We are talking of import mostly in the areas of power devices, semiconductors, processors, memories, and a large number of PCBs also being manufactured outside, LCD displays, transformers. So there is a need for us to take care of all these, and that's why Government of India thought of, particularly in the case of semiconductors, that we should set up our own foundry, VLSI design and production facility and have a strong linkage with OEM, the ODMs for accepting technically and commercially the Indian components. That means we have to create an ecosystem for these 25 products, thereby increasing the value as far as the overall system is concerned. Now, if we are doing such a mass manufacturing that it is meeting some of the needs of the country and some people also claim that we are exporting, then what is the difficulty in doing mass manufacturing of uh, defense equipment. In this segment, I would like to talk of our experience of last 40 years, where DRDO and uh, space and atomic energy, these three or four major departments, worked with the, initially with the public sectors like Bharat Electronics, ECIL and so on, to get systems which were required for their weapon system. Situation was quite bad, multi-layer PCBs were not available and, but over the years with the hand holding, there has been a tremendous growth as far as this segment is concerned. Today there are small, medium and some of them are large industries who are doing wonderful work and uh, the problems of complex electronics manufacturing, even design to a large extent, initially they were getting designs from the research laboratories, but today they are capable of doing designs. So today there is a huge defense uh, portfolio which is emerging and uh, I hope the Roland report covers all of them which starts from radars, EW systems, avionics, 
high power lasers, robots, trusted computing and communication networks, MEMS and nano devices, actuating elements, stealth items, high power electromagnetics, data networks, nitrogen systems, all of you are aware of them. But even in this segment, there has been, there is going to be a change in technology. Miniaturization and also the micro miniaturization of systems is taking place with nanotechnologies coming in a big way, both in terms of sensors, actuators and other computing systems. Mm -hmm. Space has been also doing its own way where they have uh, been able to get satellite electronics with the radiation hardening in the systems, imaging sensors, communication networks, broadband, avionics, ground control communication and so on. Atomic energy has solved its own problems of supercomputing as well as control of the systems like centrifuge and simulators and so on. Even the area of cyber security which is emerging today as a major thing, to the extent what the armed forces needed, uh, this industry has been able to provide some solutions, may not be adequate, may not be equal and that too with the absence of large number of components not being manufactured in this country, the vulnerability continues to remain. So this is the kind of situation that has emerged. But if you look at this sector and you compare it with the commercial and the consumer durable sector or other commercial electronics, I think the space, aerospace and uh, defense sector has done reasonably well. Despite that fact that this sector has got some tremendous challenges. One challenge is that it is very complex electronics, low volume, high cost. And uh, at least I have grown through an era where the technology was by and large denied. I still remember the days when 8086, 8087 chips were denied to us for manufacturing Prithvi computer. And I think situation by and large is modified to some extent, but still there are certain constraints as Dr. Chandrasekhar was talking about. We still depend on import of active devices, memories, ICs and so on. We depend on sensors like focal plane arrays, bolometers and devices, largely dependent for all the power electronics that go into the defense. And when we come to microwave and RF systems, I think our situation is not all that good because all the front end of the microwave systems, transmitters, receivers, HF components, there's a huge import dependent. And when we are now going to migrate into directed energy weapons, high power microwaves, the situation is going to be much more complex. There you will need uh, devices like uh, fiber lasers, disc lasers and so on, in which direction neither the R&D nor the industry has been able to make much headway. And the situation is going to be same as we had in the case of ICs in 80s and 90s that these items will be denied to us. So there is a re strong requirement for R&D and basic requirement for setting up facilities for manufacturing components in these areas. So there's a vulnerability of uh, design and manufacturing because we have software which are compromised, we have hardware which are compromised. And uh, this is happening because in fact, I would like to share my anguish on this. While India is considered to be a software power, but when it comes down to the real crux of building softwares which are required for aerospace and defense, I don't think I can name even one software which is needed for simulation, computation, parallel processing or anything which is being done in this country. We are still dependent on all the licenses which come and many times those licenses are denied. So I yet to see that software power to really factor into the requirements of aerospace and defense. Poor innovation ecosystem is certainly there because many times we are going into the, into the designs but we don't have the facilities for mass manufacturing. Poor industrial expertise in design. So if you look at, uh, despite these challenges, the defense aerospace has done well. I want to mention that. Because today we have uh, industries and national laboratories which are doing embedded systems, computers, microprocessors, parallel processing computers, communication links, radars and sonars and EW systems, trusted platforms for security 
and uh, data centers, control centers, bulk encryptors, homing seekers to some extent, satellite-based transponders, images, inertial measurement units, altimeters, which are the major units which are going into different weapon systems. Now, all this has happened despite all the industrial deficiencies which existed, mainly because a group of industries in this country, in the private sector, in the public sectors, focused into system engineering of the defense products, making use of the available components, devices in the international market to the extent they were made available to us. And wherever they were not made available to us, I still remember Dr. Kalam's uh, push for combating MTCR in 1990s, where we had to really struggle to harden the commercial components for use in the aircrafts and missiles. And also design and develop many of the systems like uh, DC-DC converters and all within the country. That push has really resulted in some of the component manufacturing factories coming up. But unfortunately, due to our policies on that and the growing international market, the China effect, even the component industry which came up in 90s has started going down and they have most of them have become traders. So we have that situation to be overcome. How was this possible? This was possible because system engineering expertise existed. The use of quartz component could be done. Ruggedization and technologies miniaturization could be done. Medium performance systems could be made use of by doing proper error modeling as to give higher performance in terms of inertial systems and so on. VLSI design capability exists and that was leveraged by getting the components and devices manufactured in the foreign CMOS facilities. Participation of Indian industry was very good and I, in that respect I would like to really say thanks to a large number of small and medium industries which grew up during this period and today they are some of the pioneers in doing the defense uh, subsystems and systems. Many of them are designers today. They worked with the national labs. National labs like ANURAG, LRD, RCI, DLRL, NPOL, Space Application Center, VSSC, BARC, all of them made possible despite all kinds of odds this happened. But in this segment, if you really want to overcome, we have to make sure that we build those capabilities which have been denied to us. Now that's the point which comes. On the one hand, these facilities are denied to us. On the other hand, when we make investment decisions to set up systems, we always say that it is not commercially viable in terms of the volumes. Unfortunately, the volumes, as I told you, in the defense and aerospace are so low that investments in component manufacturing facility, particularly VLSI, CMOS facilities, or gallium nitride, or gallium arsenide, or all these foundries certainly has a major question mark. But we can't wish it away. Because if you want to get cyber security problems solved tomorrow, if you want to have trusted platforms and networks, if you want to reduce Pakistan coming and hacking all your systems all the time, then you have to really make those investments. And as a result, in these areas like uh, gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, silicon nitride, there is a major push which uh, we have started. Indian Institute of Science has now come up with a proposal for setting up a gallium nitride foundry. And we are trying to push that in terms of uh, giving first the basic technology buildup and later on setting up that. Similarly, investments have been made in the past in, in areas like MEMS and Nano. I think the time has come for us to now leverage those investment by proper synchronizing our efforts in academia and industries to make sure that that investment does not go waste. Subcritical diffused approach funding has resulted in no MAM system available to any one of us. Neither it in the automobile sector nor in the aerospace sector. We need to really pull up our socks, make more investment if required, but at least meet the requirement of the strategic sector. And with the focus becoming more and more on uh, cyber physical systems, IoT coming as a major thing, I think we cannot wish away the fact that there is a growing market and India should certainly leverage those capabilities. We have to do that. We have to strengthen the Indian electronic component market, which is about 9.2 billion. For example, active 2.19. Now, I am surprised when I am looking at uh, setting up the VLSI, this uh, CMOS foundry, 
I find that the numbers which are presented for import of the ICs and, and, and on the memories and all that are very, very, uh, while the report says very large in terms of uh, rupees and dollars, but when we talk to the industry, they say we don't import components. We import the fully loaded uh, um, uh, PCBs and then we make the systems. So even if today I set up a VLSI foundry, that component, that microprocessor or that IC, how many of you will actually purchase? Will the telecom industry take for making their own cell phone or making their own server a device which the Indian foundry will produce? They have long-term agreements with Samsung, with this and that, with particular uh, chip manufacturer or Qualcomm or Broadcom for, uh, for 10 years. Now, where does this Indian product get into? because the product manufacturing companies in this country are already doing what we call as assembly of the systems which are coming from outside. Now, how many of you are ready to change over and take from PCB design to taking the Indian component and getting into the market, which is a very, very difficult task. So when we look at viability of CMOS foundry, we find it is not a very viable proposition. What do we do? I think the only answer lies in strategic sector coming in a big way and taking the brunt of it and the fallout of that would be in the civilian sector. Unfortunately, we are not able to leverage that and as a result, the strategic sector in terms of, 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 of the foundry system, their push is not there. Whereas the commercial people are pushing, but they have their hands tied because the product manufacturing companies are not able to purchase the Indian system. So when I ask the investor to start investing in the foundry, he says, sir, where is the market? When we go to the bankers, they say, show us the market, we will put the money. Friends, how do you solve this problem? All of you are wise people sitting here. You have got uh, industries running. You have got associations. Give me a solution we will try to implement. That's the kind of thing we would like to do that. So this is the situation as, as far as the CMOS industry is concerned. We have similar problems in high frequency electronics. We have problems which are going to happen because future is going to be photonics based electronic system where integrated silicon photonics will come. And again, if the defense and aerospace does not push this, for the civil sector to start pushing this, it will not be feasible. Because again, there is going to be investment in R&D, making multi-chip modules, making CMOS uh, compatible with photonics application, converting all your software, which is presently running on purely CMOS devices, requires a huge R&D effort, which the industry has to now start doing it today. That today, it cannot be purely left with the, with, the, with the national laboratories, I think the R&D segment has to come in the industry in a big way. Often we have found that uh, high power electronics is a major issue, and uh, including even the batteries. Yesterday I was in the CSIR laboratory at uh, Chennai. We were looking at advanced energy storage systems. For the armed forces, this is a major requirement, lithium ion battery how much we import right from cell phone batteries to the, to the variety of applications. So we found that there is a laboratory in CSIR which has built a cylindrical cell as well as a prismatic cell. They have made a UPS backup using those cells. It is running. It's almost four volt and about one milliampere hour kind of a cell. Then we looked at the industry who would be willing to take up this. We find that industry asks, sir, what is the investment? 760 crores. If 760 crores is the investment, sir, what will be the return next year if I invest today? Friends, industries don't work like that. You can't expect that you are putting 760 crores today and day after tomorrow you will get return on investment equal to your bank uh, interest rates. If Indian industry start looking at this, I don't think we can do anything in aerospace, defense and this one. So we have to change our track. We have to be a horse which is ready for a long hop. We, we cannot be saying that I'm going to invest now 700 crores over a period of five years and I start getting 10%, 20% return from next year onwards. This way, investment will not come. Now, people say India has got into startups. 
where is this startup coming now? A mature technology available. Because this startup is not going to give you the fruits the way a startup in the software segment is giving or in the app segment is giving the angel investors, the, the, the incubators or other bankers, they are not willing. Now, that is the kind of a thing which has to be supported by the government in a low cost, sorry, high cost, low volume items, the investment has to be supported mainly by the government. We are looking at uh, certification, which is going to be a major requirement if you have to be globally competitive. Because without export in this segment, I don't think the Indian industry can survive. For export, standardization and certification and testing facilities, this is another one which I suggest some of the platforms like IESA and NASCOM and along with the government should set up in these clusters what we have been talking about, uh, the certification and test facilities which will go a long way in supporting at least the medium and the small scale industries which will be doing subsystems for their defense. Wafer fabrication centers for silicon, I mentioned to you about gallium arsenide, gallium nitride and so on. Global scenario is also changing today, I want to tell you. People have been saying that we are competing with China. China has got large pool of manpower, low wage rate and so on. But uh, reports are suggesting today that things are changing. There's an increased labor cost and competition of, uh, for talent there, rise in cost of power. IPR issues are there with, in China. Increased transportation and shipping costs, single country sourcing. So many people today are thinking of shifting base from China to other countries. And India happens to be the next destination. In fact, I will quote something which we said. Wave one was shift of manufacturing from USA to Japan. Wave two was a shift from Japan to Europe, which happened in 1970 and 80. Wave three is the shift of Southeast Asia to China. And I am sure the wave four is shift from China to India. And that's what is going to happen. I was talking to the Korean uh, industry people, and they said, Almost 90% of the products which Korea wants to do, they would be doing in India indigenously. Similarly, European and similarly US, similarly the, some of the Indian who are saying that, in the, at least in the consumer durables, that they would like to increase the indigenous content. So that is a export opportunity. And this export is not to Europe. I think this export is more to UAE and other areas where SARC countries, where you will have preference for the Indian goods. Now, what are the impediments today? I talk to you about the policy. As for the policy is concerned, we have still issues. While the 2013 policy did some changes, but we still have issues with respect to tax and the duty structure. We have inverted duty structure in many cases, and that is resulting in our component industry really packing off. Absence of component manufacturing ecosystem. We have uh, issues with respect to working capital, particularly for the larger, uh, smaller and uh, the, the medium industries. There is an improvement in ease of doing business and uh, regulatory systems, clearance systems are better today, but still a lot has to be done. But the most important thing is there is barely any innovation. What innovation is taking place today in the, in, in, in the IT sector is again, I would be saying that it is mostly in the software area, apps based. Engineering